Hey everybody, Caleb here with a new entry into the Film Newbie series. This time I'm going over the legendary film Citizen Kane. I'm choosing this film for a couple of reasons, but the biggest reason is that I think this is a film that a lot of people have heard of in some way or another, even if it's just the name of it, but many people have not actually watched the film itself. There are references to this film in all sorts of media, different movies, TV shows, etc., but I think they tend to just go over a lot of people's heads since they've never actually seen the film. I have two goals for this video. To explain why this film is so revolutionary for its time and why it became so influential. And two, I want to convince you that this film is worth going out of your way to watch. I know the tendency is to see that a film is older, it's black and white, and not really worth watching. But I believe that this film is held up to the test of time incredibly well for its age, even without the color or some of the special effects we've come to expect in movies. And this is due to how revolutionary it was for the time, from a technical aspect, but also in the way it's narrative is played out. I want to give just a little bit of a history of the film and of the man behind the film, Orson Welles. So this film was released in 1941 and was directed and produced by Orson Welles, who also stars as the main character, Charles Foster Kane. Kane is the head of a large newspaper who starts out as someone who is looking to take down the corrupt, power-hungry business tycoons, but ultimately he uses his business to further his own power. This story is told through a series of flashbacks, which shows a news reporter looking to figure out the meaning behind Kane's last word, Rosebud. Before jumping into what made this film revolutionary for its time, I want to further talk about why this film was made in the first place. Not only do I think this is a fascinating story, but I think it explains why Wells used some of the techniques that he did in creating something revolutionary in the first place. Orson Welles began primarily as a theater actor and also working on the radio, where he made his famous broadcast of The War of the Worlds. He was always intrigued by the film industry, but it took a special contract to get him into it. He signed with RKO Pictures, who gave him a contract which allowed him to develop his own story, choose his own cast and crew, which he used to get a lot of people from theater and radio to work on this film, and the ability to have final say on editing choices. All of these exceptions were unheard of in that day, and a contract like that really hasn't been seen since because it makes little financial sense for a studio to give all of that freedom to someone when it has the possibility of failing, which Citizen Kane did from a box office perspective, it didn't make its money back on its original release. All of these factors allowed Wells to create a film which he had the ability to try all sorts of different techniques without the studio interfering, and that is what created such a unique film for its time. Its narrative and technical innovations allowed this film to be revolutionary, and it's why it became such an inspiration for future filmmakers. So here I'm going to talk about the more technical aspects of this film, and for a film like this, it had the ability to make or break it, and many Many of these aspects were different from what other directors of the time were doing. A lot of this had to do with Wells' experience, or rather lack of experience. He himself said that the only reason he dared to try so many different techniques was because of quote, ignorance, sheer ignorance. A large part of what makes Citizen Kane special is its new camera techniques, which cinematographer Greg Toland helped Wells pioneer. The two main unique cinematography innovations were the use of deep focus and of low angle shots. Deep focus is when everything in the frame is in focus, which today sounds relatively easy to do and it's very common in films. But back then it took a lot of work with different lenses and lighting to make that sort of focus work. A lot of films at this time could only focus on either the foreground or the background of an image, which inevitably led to the film losing a sense of realism, since things did not look like how people actually see. But the deep focus technique made it so that as much as was possible with the technology they had, the frame looked like how the human eye perceives everything. This innovation changed a a lot of how films were made and it made it so that a lot of other directors started creating this technique in their own films and further trying to make film more realistic look more how the real world looks instead of being simply a theater production captured on film low angle shots also allowed for greater background to be seen in shots including ceilings which again was not something that movie sets in this time had because there was no need for them again going back to it was basically theater plays that were filmed on camera. But with low angle shots, you actually had to build a roof. You actually had to make things look more realistic. All of the sets on Citizen Kane had fabric ceilings, but because of the lighting, they looked convincingly real. It's a very simple technique, but it adds to the realism. And today that looks pretty simple. It's unimpressive, but it made future films continually look more realistic to incorporate simple things as a ceiling in a roof 
film to be realistic, along with the cinematography or the quote unquote special effects. And I use quotes because back then they absolutely were special effects, but for today they don't look that impressive. Most of these were either to improve the deep focus that I was talking about earlier, or to create the illusion of deep focus in scenes where it was impossible to shoot it in that way. At this time they were still using actual film to film movies, and so a lot of this was done by filming a scene, rewinding the film while changing the physical scenery, and then refilming over the existing footage with a different focus, thereby creating two different focuses on the same film. You had to be really careful with it so you didn't corrupt the film, but that's how they got it to look like there were two focuses in the same scene. Besides the cinematography, this movie's use of sound and makeup were also exceptional for the time. For the sound, Wells used his radio background to add synchronization between the film and the sound. Wells believed that the sound of a film was just as important as the visual aspect of the film, something that modern audiences take for granted today, but it makes a huge difference. If the sound doesn't line up with what you're seeing on screen, things seem disjointed, things don't seem realistic, but when the audio that you hear matches up with what you're seeing, it creates a much more realistic experience. For the makeup, the biggest innovation was the use of plaster molds of the actors to age them, to make them look like they were older, which Wells credited Maurice Siderman with creating. These molds allowed for practical makeup to make the actors look older, and that's something that even modern movies sometimes still have trouble with, making someone appear older than what they actually are. But in Citizen Kane, this makeup still looks pretty good, because it's all practical, it's all done right there. These are just a few of the technical innovations, I don't want to go over everything that this movie did, it just simply would take too much time, but all of these innovations led to this movie becoming the classic that it is today. I want to talk briefly about the narrative structure of this film, because it adds to more of the innovation of what the film was, because it's told by many different narrators, and it's told through flashbacks. The use of jumping back and forth between time settings, as well as the use of more than one narrator, were techniques that were not used by films of the time, because they did not fit the formula that studios believed worked. The use of both of these allowed the film to stand out, and Wells is able to balance the narrative jumping around so that it doesn't feel tedious, it doesn't feel like it's out of place. Before I make my final appeal to why this film is worth watching for modern audiences, I want to give a few critiques of the film that have been expressed, because I think it's only fair to make an informed decision about a film when placing value on it. I've talked a lot about how this film innovated a lot of different cinematography and other technical uses throughout the film, but some argue that this film did not pioneer these techniques, but rather it simply borrowed them from other films and just did a good job of putting them all into one film. A big critique comes from those who say that a category of films known as German Expressionist films from the 1920s did this long before Wells did. Films such as The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is probably the most famous film from this category. The use of flashbacks were also not wholly original to Citizen Kane, rather that it uses them more than any film had up to that point. It seems that Citizen Kane did not necessarily create a lot of the techniques that it was praised for innovating, but rather that instead of just using one or two that these other films did, it used a bunch of them within one film, and it made it innovative in the fact that it could break the mold of traditional filmmaking and still create a cohesive, engaging film. Basically, it was willing to take risks that other films weren't, and it did it in more than one area. It took the work of others and tweaked it and made it its own, but it created something entirely unique. And of course, this is just another opinion I share with other people who have brought up these critiques, but it's one I believe is supported by the evidence from other films. Okay, so after all the talk about technical filmmaking and different techniques that the film used and critiques of it, at the end of the day, why should people watch this film? Why is it worth taking your time to watch an old drama when there are other films out there that may be more enjoyable? For me, the point of this series is to highlight films for people who haven't watched a lot of film, who maybe want to understand more of what film is, or simply get a better understanding of the classics. This film is the epitome of classic. Its place in American cinema cannot be understated. I truly believe that watching this film has made me understand other films so much better, either by understanding where filming techniques in other films come from, or what certain references in some films are actually referencing. To understand cinema in a better way, or at the very least American cinema, is absolutely necessary to watch this film. This film established so much of what American cinema became, and without this film, it may have taken longer for American films to come to the high quality that they reached. If none of that stuff interests you, if you're not really someone who is into the classics, or you're not looking to understand cinema in a different way, it's still a film that holds up well in terms of quality. It's an engaging story, it's interesting, the mystery over the term Rosebud, 
blood is still intriguing and it's well acted. There are a few moments where the age of the film is apparent in terms of its special effects, but overall this is still a good movie and it looks like it could have come out later than 1941 when it actually came out because the quality of the film is still very high. That's where I'm going to leave this film. I know I've already gone on longer than most of my other videos and there's a lot more to say but I want to be somewhat brief. If you're curious about the film at all, I've left a few links in the description below that talk more about the film, uh, reactions to the film, positive and negative reviews, and hope you do more research on the film. It's a very fascinating film to research and its history is also intriguing about how it got made and the reactions to it. I do hope you check out this film. It's one that while a lot of people have seen it, it's still held in high regard. I think a lot of people who are maybe younger or not as well versed in cinema as a whole, they probably haven't seen it even if they've heard of it. So I'd recommend just checking it out, going out of your way to just view it. If you like this video, give it a like and leave a comment below about what you think of the film, if you've seen it or if you haven't, or even if you're interested in watching it. Also, if you have any suggestions about what film I should cover next, or if you have any other series for me to review films in, I would love to hear them. I want to add more ways to look at film, and I'm not opposed to doing the same film again and looking at it in a different way. If you like the content on this channel, consider subscribing, as it is the best way to support me and the channel. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for next time.